Glasswire is the ultimate firewall and network monitoring software. Check it out at the link below. Hey, what's up guys? CP Modi here, back with another video, and today we're taking a look at the Gigabyte B360D3H. Now, the D3H series has been around for quite some time, and today we're taking a look at the latest iteration, so let's go ahead and jump in and see what it is all about. So, the B360M D3H board from Gigabyte offers a great balance between high-end features, but also to visuals and everything you would expect from a quality board without going over the top. And thanks to its approximate $150 Australian price, tag it's actually not really the cheapest board but also too not the most expensive board you can buy so let's take a look in the visuals department first and foremost to see what gigabyte has packed in this kind of middle of the road motherboard now in terms of actual visuals it's actually keeping things pretty stealthy and clean with a monochrome aesthetic the board is actually dark with a matte finish there's also two light gray accents on top of this that translate to a really nice look and also two copies over to the PCI Express and also to RAM connectors and general other surface mount components for a really nice well put together colour scheme. The black and grey kind of aesthetic works really well in my opinion and should go well with a lot of other systems out there as the motherboard doesn't stand out like in the days when Gigabyte did blue motherboards for whatever reason. The VRM and chipset heat sinks also too don't stand out like a sore thumb and also to help to add to the clean finish as most of us come to expect these kind of heat sinks on a motherboard. And taking a look at actually the surface mount components this guy absolutely looks busy. With a lot of components being mounted here, it's kind of a far cry from what an entry level board would have. And whilst here in 2018, a lot of us are kind of trending towards putting absolutely LEDs on everything, the fact that Gigabyte didn't do this, in my opinion, was definitely a good move, as now the motherboard fits in with a lot of other systems. Sure, some people would have liked to have seen RGB LEDs integrated with this guy, but honestly, it doesn't really matter too much. This guy is, however, compatible with Gigabyte's RGB Fusion LED software, so even though it doesn't have any LEDs on this guy, it does have a header available, so you can go ahead and sync up all your LEDs in your system, thanks to the fact that this option is available. However, taking a closer look at the actual motherboard itself, we do find ourselves two 16x physical PCI Express slots, however, one of them is wired for 8x electrical, which doesn't really matter too much, you can throw a GPU in either one of them, though it is recommended just to run them in 16x mode, and we can actually run Crossfire on this guy. Unfortunately, for NVIDIA fans though, we can't run SLI, so it's a bit of a letdown that we can't run multi-video cards on the NVIDIA side, but for the AMD fans, Crossfire is definitely supported. We also do get a PCI Express 1X slot and also to a PCI slot, so really whatever expansion you're planning to do with your system, it's definitely got you covered. Sure, it might not have as much as some of the super premium stuff, but definitely has enough expansion for most systems out there. In terms of RAM, we get ourselves 4 DIMMs with support for up to 64GB of dual channel DDR4 memory, and the CPU is powered by an 8-pin EPS power connection, so we should have plenty of juice for high-end i7 systems. Now speaking of power, that 24-pin is strangely mounted to a really high section of the motherboard. If we take a look at this side-by-side -side with really anything from Gigabyte's previous series, or even something from a more modern uh, vendor, we see that they're quite lower on a lot of motherboards out there. Now I'll touch on this in just a moment, I did find it a little bit odd that it was so high on the motherboard, though with that being said, on the plus side, we do get ourselves a nice big heatsink over the VRM, so kind of makes up one for the other. However, with that being said, even though we just put a big heatsink over the VRM, we're really not going to be using it too much, as the B360 chipset unfortunately doesn't support overclocking on the new generations of CPUs. But for the high-end 6 cores out there, there's definitely some decent cooling that can be done, thanks to the fact that, well, it has a massive big heatsink over this guy. In the LAN department, we are handled by the Intel GBE chipset, and in terms of the audio department, Realtek is back at again with the ALC892 chipset. So, overall, audio is isn't too bad. And even with that being said, we also do get ourselves USB-C, so in terms of I.O. and connectivity, this guy is definitely showing it off here in 2018 with plenty of connectivity. However, unfortunately, I didn't see an internal USB-C header, which is something I'm really looking forward to in a lot of mid to high end systems this year, but unfortunately, Gigabyte just didn't put it on. Though with that being said, let's go ahead and actually jump into a build and sort of see what I kind of experienced with this board. Now, jumping into the build, the first and foremost thing that I did notice was that 24-pin in a 
rather weird location. As I did mention, it's quite high on the motherboard. As we've come to expect, 24 pins are usually towards the middle of the motherboard, but for some reason, Gigabyte's chucked it sort of really, really high. Now, for 99% of us, this is really isn't going to be much of a problem, and let's face it, even if it is slightly a problem for you, it's really not that much of a big problem. I did notice when I went ahead and plugged it in that some actual cases have the cutout in the middle where general 24 pins would sit. Unfortunately, this guy's a bit higher, so you have to kind of run it up into more of a viewable site. Again, if you do have a nice power supply and kind of a mid-range system, it's not going to be much of an issue, but I kind of found it really weird that it was so high for no particular reason. Thankfully, though, I didn't actually have any problems in the particular build I was doing or the particular case I was using, and I guess as sort of a further problem with this also too, the SATA ports were moved up. It just kind of seems super odd for it to be this kind of high on the motherboard, and then that also too brings things like the SATA ports higher up on the motherboard, which really isn't that much of a problem because, let's face it, you're putting an MATX board into a system. Unless you're building in a really massive case, you're not going to have any problems with the ATX connectors and also to, I guess, the SATA ports in the locations that they are. Again, this is definitely not a major problem and wouldn't be a make it or break it deal, but it is definitely something you want to keep in mind with your next build. The M.2 slot was super sweet, supporting Optane SSDs and super fast SSDs at that. However, there is unfortunately no heat spreaders over this guy or any covers, so whatever SSD you put in there will be fully visible. So if you're picking up something like the Samsung SSDs, which are really great quality, especially their more budget stuff that run the green PCB, you'll straight up be able to see the green PCB. Surface mount components and overall the whole motherboard felt really solid. Whenever you're plugging in a connector, there's no wiggles, squeaks or anything like that out of the board and whilst you shouldn't really go bending the motherboard, I did find it to be really rigid in its design. Oh, and also two fan headers were also do not too bad with two on the top of the motherboard, one over on the right hand side and one on the bottom. Most cases out there should definitely be served not too bad with this fan array setup. Though that being said, on the downsides, well, there was a couple downsides with this particular motherboard. The aforementioned 24 pin makes it kind of in a weird location. Again, it's not a break it or break it deal, but would have been nice to see a little bit lower. The lack of right angle connectors at all in this motherboard definitely was a bit of a pain, but thanks to the fact that it is a mid range kind of motherboard, I'm not really expecting it to have a whole bunch of right angle connectors everywhere. And also to the lack of an M.2 cover or heat spreader was definitely a pain for those trying to save a little bit of money on their SSD, but still get decent performance out of the system. The fans of RGBs out there definitely will be a little bit of a letdown as there's no RGB LEDs built into this guy, but thankfully it does make up for it with its RGB Fusion integration, which actually works pretty well. But all in all, Gigabyte has put together definitely a solid motherboard for the price point it comes in. Sure, this motherboard definitely has its quirks, but honestly, that wouldn't really stop me buying this motherboard. It's something I would want to keep in mind, but wouldn't really be a make it or break it deal for this mid-range type of motherboard. Whether your build is mid or more of a low-end system, it definitely has a lot of options out there and wouldn't be a deal breaker. I definitely like this solid looking BRM cooling despite not having an overclocking support chipset, so whether or not it was solid or not looking, it didn't really matter there. But I guess with that being said, let me know down in the comment sections what you think of this board. RGB, should you have it or should you not? Again, let me know down below. Otherwise, you can also do find links in the description box to pick up this motherboard. And with that being said, thanks all for watching and I'll catch you all in the next one.